Hello and welcome to our telesummit and podcast series on preventing cancer, exposing the environmental causes. I'm your host, Jenny LaMorgan, owner of GreenWomanStore.com, where we enjoy creating educational tools like this podcast series on topics important to us as women. I'm excited to be here with our guest, Christy Marsh, who is going to talk to us about protecting those you love. Christy was diagnosed with aggressive stage 3 breast cancer at age 35 with three young children at home. She has since become the founder and force behind Choose Wiser. She's a nationally recognized and celebrated advocate for women's environmental health, and Christy Marsh says it is possible to have tremendous impact on protecting those around you, your friends, family, and children, and your community, even if they aren't interested or think you're a bit out there. Christy will encourage you to become a role model for others and an advocate for a healthier environment. This telesummit is about our health, it's about our politics, what we know and what we need to know about cancer and preventing cancer and its recurrence. It's about medical practices, our environment, and our science. We've invited women experts whose passion it is to educate and encourage others toward health and political action. So let me introduce you to our guest. Christy Marsh is a stay-at-home mom of teenagers and the founder of Choose Wiser. She's an award-winning speaker and breast cancer warrior. She is the author of Little Changes, Tales of a Reluctant Home Economics Pioneer, and Christy is recognized by the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics as a rock star advocate. She makes it her work to connect us to the simmering and unfolding world of environmental health. She speaks at press conferences in Washington, D.C., and to the CEOs and founders of the beauty industry. Christy says that by becoming an advocate for your own beautiful body and health, you are becoming an advocate for future generations. The good news is that you don't have to do it from scratch or or do it alone. Christy Marsh will share her tools, resources, and lessons learned from her own journey from mainstream mom to advocate and educator, creating not just a healthy home, but a healthy world for all of us. Welcome, Christy, and thank you so much for all of your advocacy work. Well, thank you. How exciting to be here today. Thank you very much. Um, Have you always been an advocate for environmental health? Actually, no. I grew up very mainstream. Um, I was not raised with a sustainable or a green environment or atmosphere or parenting necessarily. I grew up in California. I think my teen years were mostly spent at the mall. I went off to be the career girl and then to be a stay-at-home mom. At the core of it all, I really wanted to do the best that I could. You know, I was always trying to find the, the next best thing to feed my children for food, always was a gym member, working out. But in terms of having this environmental health focus, this was an entirely new world for me. Um, once I hit breast cancer and I started on this new journey that I call Choose Wiser. And you had the tumor um, removed and you did chemotherapy and then you really had the courage. I mean, I think it's really courageous to think about taking on all of the changes that it, that's required in our homes and as a mom. You know, is that why you wrote the book Little Changes? Because I, oh. I, I'm reading that book and I think it's marvelous. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you. I do love my my little girl, Little Changes. But it really started not necessarily due to breast cancer itself. It's kind of hard for me to give cancer the credit for this, this journey in my life. But it was more during chemotherapy when I was taking the, the chemotherapy itself, which, which is a toxin, but we willingly put it into our bodies in order to eradicate cancer cells. Uh, it has its drawbacks, but it has some pluses that at the time are more important than anything else for those of us who choose it. But the other thing it does is it goes in and it eradicates everything from your lining of your stomach to the roof of your mouth, white blood cells, red blood cells, which is why chemotherapy patients then need to 
recover and they have a span of time to rebuild their strength in order to take it again. And many of us are familiar with that if you've taken care of a loved one who's gone through chemotherapy. And it was in this window, this time period, that I would take an infusion and within hours, within a nighttime, my body was rebuilding. You know, I was making more red blood cells and white blood cells and repairing the lining of my stomach and repairing, well, not so much the hair cells. That seemed to take a little while. But it was this idea that my body had one obsession, and that was just to give me this beautiful gift of life. And I got to this point that I realized, why why would I ever want to compromise that beautiful gift ever again? And that's when I, I started to look around at, well, what can I do different this time? How can I build a better body and a builder bed, build a better life for myself and my children? And it really wasn't about the public and communities and you know our, our beautiful country at that time. It was just about respecting my own body. And at one point I realized, you know what, this isn't about being a cancer patient. My children, when they wake up in the mornings, my friends, when they wake up, every single one of us, this is what our bodies are doing. So that's what started me off on this quest of mine. All right. Well, that's um, quite a journey, and I think that chemotherapy and, and just the way that our bodies heal so much that happens to us, you know, whether it's skinning our knee or, or having something like chemo that just really wreaks havoc in your whole body. It's, it's quite a miracle what our body can heal. Um, can you speak specifically to breast cancer and your work in prevention and advocacy? Because I think you're doing marvelous, marvelous things, having, having a woman's voice in the White House and at these, um, talking to these CEOs. You know, it gives them a voice that they don't normally hear. Oh, thank you. That's that's a big question you asked there, and you touched on a lot of subjects in one sentence there. When I started creating little changes in my own home, and then I started to realize that community members, friends, carpooling friends, book club friends, they were kind of curious about what I was doing. And the information that I had come across, whether at the time it was through a book called Exposed or Stacey Malkin's Not Just a Pretty Face, or the, the various different reports and books that exist out there, I was feeling like the information and the science has unfolded over the last decade within our own generation, but it hasn't filtered down to my world, what I consider the mainstream or what I affectionately call the everyday means. And that became my place. That became this this mission of mine of wanting every he and she and her and they out there to have this knowledge that I had had um, been able to come across and have them to be able to make their choices for themselves. And really, really, that's what I want. So my focus is very, very broad, and it's on, on health and re- respecting our bodies and how we can make better decisions. But then I have this definitely this personal interest in pursuing those chemicals or toxins that are particularly rated or related towards breast cancer or that encourage breast cancer, as obviously I feel like I have an obligation to make a better world for my own daughter as well. Mm-hmm. And so you're talking about the hormone disruptors and the plastics and that kind of thing. Sure, yes. I think that there's... Um, some very fascinating, I like to say sometimes horrifyingly fascinating topics out there that to be able to have some great discussion with women over things that would be, like you said, endocrine disruptors. So Mm -hmm. ingredients that are found not just in some lab far away or in some, you know, rare product, but in our everyday cosmetics or in everyday plastics that when they interact with our own bodies, they behave like hormone disruptors. So there's lots of little steps there that I felt like I, as someone who was transitioning into this world, had to accept. I had to accept the idea that ingredients and chemicals don't always stay put, that they can often leave products, whether it's like in a plastic water bottle or plastic plates that we use in the house, that they can leave or leach out of products, 
and then go into our bodies. Then there was the idea that once um, chemicals or toxins are inside our bodies, we don't just flush them on out, but that they can, some of them have a tendency to seek out our fatty areas, which could be breast tissue or other things, and build up within our bodies. Um, One of the other ideas is this idea that it doesn't have to be this powerful, large amount of toxins, Um, some say some some sort of poison that you have locked up high up in a cabinet that would be a toxin to us, but something that comes into our bodies at just minuscule rates. And that's just as powerful because our body then doesn't see it as a toxin and send off giant alarms and, and try to protect our bodies. But if it comes into us through, say, our cosmetics or food or cleaning products, then our bodies then view it as just something that's, you know, part of a norm. It doesn't come in with alarming rates. And so there's all these different pieces that I had to emotionally process as an everyday me to understand what was happening in our world. And it's those pieces that makes this topic so discussionable, you know, and allowing the women we talk to, whether it's our friends and or sitting over a glass of wine going, hey, have you heard of this this whole movement with – cosmetics or our cleaning products and allowing the women to kind of move through the emotions that we have about this. You know, one thing that I really appreciated about your book was how you blend the science, the science of our bodies, how our bodies work and how our bodies deal with uh, at a cellular level, how we deal with toxins. And then you blend that with um, all of the facts, and you do it in a way that really makes it able, make, made me able to take it in oh, at the cellular you. level. <laughs> do you know? Because I, I you, 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 it's not in a scientific, you know, jargon. It's really in a woman's jargon and, and, and how our bodies work. And I really appreciated that. And you just talked about it in in the same way that you write about it. (laughs) You just gave me chills. And I cannot think of a higher compliment than hearing that. That All of the information, endocrine disruptors, um, the toxins, the chemicals, the academics and the science, investigative reports, it exists, and it exists in lots of different books out there that anyone could go out and read. But what I, I truly, truly felt is that imagine maybe in a book club scenario or even speaking to a sister-in-law or a best friend, we as women, we don't hand each other books that are doomy and gloomy and alarmist, and we don't hand them to each other and say, hey, read this. It's going to mess up your whole way of life, and you're going to run and want to run and hide your head. <laughs> we don't do that to each other. And for this mm-hmm. message to be moved forward, I felt it had to be flipped. It had to be embraced in a positive way. It had to be shared mm-hmm. in a way that we can do this in little steps, in little changes, and that it would be blended with a woman's story. And if someone handed little changes forward, to a family member and said, this this is a woman's story about what she did after she encountered breast cancer, then I'd be more than happy because then along the way, the reader then has this chance in their very own time, in their own intimate space, to start to realize and read about what's going on out there with the cosmetics and our food and our cleaning products. Well, it's a very sisterly thing that you've done with this book, Little Changes. Thank you again. So so your little changes started with indoor toxins. And um, maybe you can talk a little bit about where we can start making changes that will create healthier homes and help help us all to prevent cancer in our families. Sure, sure. I tried to tackle this in the beginning in, in several different ways myself, and I hope that people learn from my story, and then they can just jump in miles ahead of me. Uh, I started by taking the spreadsheet and collecting every chemical that I could find in books that I was reading and trying to organize them and 
start flipping labels and trying to eliminate them in my home. But once I got to 30, 50, 70 columns on the spreadsheet, I said, that's not working for me. Um, so then I tried, you know, in, in different manners, you know, can I do this in a way that it was simpler and, and easier? One, because if it wasn't going to be fun, then this wasn't going to last very long for me. So I ended up boiling it down to three different focal points, the things that we put on our body, such as the cosmetics, um, our food system, and then the things that we surround ourselves in. So when it comes down to where should we start, I honestly say the best place to start is one of those three that sounds the most interesting. The home surroundings one, which often involves cleaning products and starting to look at what we have in our home, is take one of them, evaluate it, and replace it with a better one, and then move forward. What I like about this particular area is there's so many ways to save money. We either use less or we use simpler, and we use things that have been tried and true and used for a long time. And so a lot of women like to start in this venue, not because they like to clean, but because it's so money-saving focused. Uh, other women feel that starting with their food system, starting with maybe how do I take out something called like BPA from our canned food and find better alternatives. Some people like to focus with food. Again, there's a lot of simpler alternatives. And when you start really, what happened to me is when I started getting rid of all the processed food that contained some nasty preservatives and packaging, my cooking actually improved because I was using healthier foods. My family enjoyed that one. Then, of course, then there's a third Very category. Good which is our, our cosmetics and our personal, not just cosmetics because we think makeup, but personal care products in general, which includes everything from, from hand soap to shampoos and everything along that line. And that one's a little bit more challenging because the injury, industry in itself is going through an identity crisis and having to find better alternatives. Now, that was about five years ago. And with the power of these women coming together through the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics um, and just everyday me's out there kind of letting the companies know what they want, we're starting to have more and more options, which is just so exciting to know that companies are out there making better for us products now. And in some cases, those same companies um, are, are now bringing us the products that they sell in Europe because European women won't buy the toxic products that we buy here. <laughs> Isn't that true? And it, it makes me yes. so angry at times to know that other places could have it better, You know that the same companies that bring products to us and on the other side of the ocean will change the product because the standards are higher elsewhere. And at some points I get angry about this, but what it really shows me is that it can be done that there is options and it can be done, and then I really want it more for us. <laughs> right, and then some of these companies, they know a better way to do it. You know, they they already have that mm -hmm. in their, when it in be, their processing when it becomes and their manufacturing a, model. Exactly, exactly. And when it becomes an economic liability for them to provide us with less than good products, when it becomes an economic liability, and that's when they start mm -hmm. listening. So the power, the, the power that we have as consumers is, is incredible. And it is in force right now. And it's only kind of growing and simmering and swelling right, right now here in this age. Right. And women, have, women decide on how 85% of each consumer dollar is spent. So that puts a lot of power in our hands and in our pocketbooks and on our shopping list. And, Isn't that amazing? Um, it it is an it's an amazing statistic that um, I only learned about about a year ago, and it still amazes me. So um, I think that's when we're looking for for ways to um, to keep our families healthy. I mean, there's such great examples like Johnson and Johnson putting real lavender in the baby shampoos instead mm -hmm. of the you know the the really toxic chemicals that smell like lavender, and, and mm -hmm. we've made those changes. You know, women in, in every home in America have uh, 
have have help to make those changes. So. No, I think you bring um, up a, a wonderful point there that a lot of women can take and do a little change as they do their next shopping trips or errand running, which is when you pick mm-hmm. up a product, when it's maybe even laundry detergent or something that you bring into your home, and choose fragrance-free, that there are there are standards in our country that allow companies to just put the word fragrance on the product without disclosing what the up to a thousand different ingredients are that compose of the word fragrance. And there's a few in there that are particularly of concern that hide behind the word fragrance, and one of them is called phthalates. And again, it interacts mm-hmm. with our bodies like a potential hormone. And we want to avoid that. We want to avoid phthalates. And one way we can do that is choose items that are are fragrance-free or the ones that use essential oils to create the fragrance in their products. And over the last couple of years, once you know this information, you can start looking around and you'll find places like conferences that you attend or hospitals or places of work that have signs up saying this is a fragrance-free establishment. And I just have such respect Mm -hmm. for places that stand up and do that. Well, it's really an important issue because people with environmental illness cannot go in the building. They can't go to events. They can't, you know, they can't be around somebody who uses um, dryer sheets, you know, that kind of thing. Because it really, the, the fragrances in the products really mess with our neurotransmitters. You know, and I think especially with young children too, um, even more so. So, um, and absolutely, I, I have a lot of followers over on Facebook that have multiple chemical sensitivities, which was something mm-hmm. I knew nothing about. I I couldn't even believe that it was um, an, an issue until I heard these women come forth and tell their stories about not being able to be in their own backyards when their neighbors are doing the laundry next door because of the heavy mm-hmm. scent coming out through the ventilation. Mm-hmm. But the other mm-hmm. piece that you just touched on, which is so heartbreaking, is the amount of women who I speak to at conferences who are there because they're reaching out in order to try to find something or something that will help their young children, their babies, their two-year-olds, their toddlers, their kindergartners Mm -hmm. that are dealing with with rashes and skin issues. Um, And once they start realizing that there's changes that they can make in their home that, that may help their children, that it's not the babies and the children themselves, but it could be what the babies and the children are coming into contact with. And my heart just goes out to these women who's, you know, they just, it's all about love and wanting to protect. Mm-hmm. Right. And and we think we're doing the best thing we can when we're, you know, at the grocery store, <laughs> you know. But um, but these these products are there, and, and, a, and a big part of us wants to trust the products that are on the grocery, sh- gro- grocery store shelves, and, and we really have to, we have to not that. trust That's- and we have to. Get smarter. <laughs> Absolutely. My, I, I have discussions with this with my teenage boys as often as I can, not too much. And from their perception, I was talking to my, my 16-year-old the other day, and from his perception, he was trying to categorize the past generation, meaning the one I grew up in, as people who are ignorant, you know, that we didn't get it, we weren't listening, we weren't paying attention and I gently kind of opened his eyes and said, you know, I'm not sure if that's the right word. We were trusting. You know, why wouldn't, why would we question a company? That just didn't make sense. You know, why, if it was on the shelves, it would be safe. Well, these were companies that we were raised on. And, again, that's that's a, a heartbreaking emotional issue you have to pull through and realize that there's a significant um sense of distrust now and who do we believe and where do we want to to put our trust in again and i think we're teaching our children to do research in ways that our our parents did not have to do (laughs) you know we research everything now you know we google and and ask questions and and i think we're setting good examples for our kids for the generation they're so smart they're so smart I was in Target just last week with my the same son, and he wanted a deodorant. And I, I'm writing mm-hmm. as we talk about on a blog about this that 
is going to be launched in a couple of weeks. And as a discussion that my son, he was challenging me, wanting the deodorant that was um, that all his, you know, his buddies have. Why couldn't he? Mm-hmm. And I had to choose so quickly in my brain, sitting there looking at the aisles. Do I lecture him? Do I go into this academic discussion about what phthalates were? And none of these seemed appropriate at the time. So I decided to pull up an app and it because I figured that's what he could relate to. And it's an app called Think Dirty. I pulled it up and we sat there and we scanned the different deodorants together. And it rated them up to a 10, which was glaring red and not good. And he was able to learn at the same time, which was beautiful. You know, I feel like that was my gift. Very nice. Very nice. Because then it's not, you know, when when the kids are teenagers, they have a harder time listening to us, the parents. <laughs> but if they can get it from somewhere else out in the world, it seems to have more credibility with them. And having an app. That's marvelous. <laughs> Isn't that great? And, and at least yes, then, then it's no lectures. <laughs> right, and then they can then they can take it and, and educate their peers. I know I've told my son-in-law about it, and he came home one one day from work, and he was telling me how he was telling his buddy at work about the deodorant, you know, and, and the issues <laughs> about deodorant. And so I think, and now his son is starting to use deodorant. He's twelve years old, you know, so. It, it does trickle down. It trickles down when we when we share it with one person. You know, they mm-hmm. we're all wanting to help each other. So you brought up in the beginning of our conversation this word advocate and advocacy, and it's funny because I I I dislike that word. I really do because I feel like if I'm called an advocate, that means I'm one of those people and someone who is crunchy or green or out there. And then people wouldn't resonate with me. They'd say, oh, well, I can't do that. She's, you know, she's leading a different life than me. And I really want people to know that, you know, I am one of them. Uh, I'm making the same changes that you can make. And so an advocate isn't necessarily someone who's up on a soapbox with a bullhorn or going to press conferences in D.C., but doing exactly what you just mentioned, which is, telling one person to another and gently educating and sharing and planting that seed. And that is the most powerful form of advocacy that we have. I think that's I think that's great. And I think that, that you know, in in the intro for you you said that I said that you're a, a breast cancer warrior. And just that just those three words to me says you're out there telling the truth. You know, you could say advocate or you could say truth teller. You know, and that's that carries a lot of power. Women now are having more credibility um, just because of who we are. And as as the world is changing and as our credibility is increasing, um, the news that we share and the, the new science that we share with others, I think, is going to go a long way toward, toward helping others. And that's Absolutely. really – women – are in relationship with everything and everybody. <laughs> and you're doing it yourself. You, just like you said in the beginning, providing educational tools. And providing the tools, I think, is what helps spread the message. You know, it really truly is uh, an overwhelming 70 years worth of history and mm-hmm. convoluted topic. And being able to take it in whatever way we can and turn it into a tool, whether it's little changes, which is why I wrote her, to be a tool to share forward, or doing podcasts or blogs or whatever it is to provide tools, then women can share the tools with each other. That's right. And for, for me personally, Green Woman Store has to be as much about education as it is about making sustainable products available and supporting women-owned businesses. Because if you, and that's why we always have these interviews available on Green Woman Store, so that anybody can listen free anytime and and just learn a little bit all the time. Education is um, it's it's absolute. It's how we evolve. It's how we evolve. <laughs> Wonderful. I love what you're doing. Ah, thank you very much. I love it. So let's talk a little bit about outdoor toxins because they can seem a little bit out of our reach, but 
you speak to ways that we can reduce our exposure to carcinogens outdoors? Sure, and if we're speaking, sure, there's all kinds of different toxins out there that we could maybe take a look at. But if we just wanted to simmer it down to maybe something that's more related to breast cancer or linked to breast cancer, then one of them that I'm finding is kind of a, a simmering hot topic right now is exhaust, is vehicle exhaust. And this is one of those chemicals that's related to encouraging breast cancer. But yet, when I look at it initially, it seems like, well, what can I do about that and all those cars driving by? And one of the things I'm finding is happening around at the community level is idle free zones, even in particular at at schools or around schools. And these are created and happen because a woman or a man, but a woman somewhere in the community decided this is important. We don't want these line of cars waiting before and after school idling and releasing all of this vehicle exhaust around the schools. And so someone in these communities step forward, and uh, they make idle-free zones. They work with the school systems. And I think this is a great example of something that can be done, you know, from community change makers out there. The other thing that it creates then is once it's implemented, then all of a sudden there's a chain reaction. Then people are wondering, well, how come I can't sit with my car on, especially in places like New England where there's many months so that it's pretty darn cold out there. Well, how come I can't do this? Mm-hmm. And then it comes back with education. And then it's, mm-hmm. oh, and an enlightenment. So there's so many varied steps to it, and I think that's that's a particularly good one, whether we know ourselves that we don't want to idle our cars excessively when we're sitting around waiting for, for kids coming in and out of lessons or school, or, you know, we want to take it a little bit further and create a little bit of a community action around it. And it's not just the parents in line, it's the diesel engines of the school buses. There you go. <laughs> Idling <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's what I've noticed. Uh-huh. Wow. But it's starting All right, to, that's a good one. So, yeah. so anywhere that we begin, kind of, it's like um, opening a can of worms, you know. <laughs> a lovely can, can of worms. One area. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you, you learn more and it just kind of grows. That's, that's, that's a great example. It is. You know, a lot of the information exists, and it's not that a company or a workplace or a school or a community, it's not that they – that they don't believe it or they don't want it. They just don't have someone standing up for it and making the time to make things happen. You know, my particular pet peeve is is styrene, and styrene is a a carcinogen. It's one of those chemical families that is being linked to breast cancer, and it has pretty much no use in our everyday world. Every place that we use styrene, there is a better for us option easily out there. And so it's ideas like this that as long as we start standing up and we gently educate forward, then these changes can start to be made. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right. So um, can you share with us some tools and resources for preventing cancer and breast cancer specifically? Sure, sure. Like I said, I I love to focus on the, the word health. But if many of your audience members, as well as myself, has a particular fascination with this world of breast cancer itself, uh, one would be Little Changes. So you can find Little Changes at any online bookstore at your store and at choosewiser.com as well. And I have it in paperbacks and e-books, the audio books. But there's other resources as well, and I don't mind sharing as much as I can because I feel like there's a right resource for everyone. There's a second book that I adore that came out shortly after mine by Florence Williams, and it's called Breath. And I think she's a delightful writer as well, so that's a second book. There's two websites that I love to follow and stay up on their press releases and their information that they hand out, and one of them is called The Breast Cancer Fund, and they focus on prevention of breast cancer. And they talk about a lot of the things that you and I have talked about today, again, the same type of thing of tips and how-tos and what we can do in our own homes. And then the other one is Silent Spring, which is based on the other side of the country, Mm -hmm. um, 
and they are also focused on breast cancer prevention. And they just recently came out with a very interesting press release and report about the toxic chemicals that we really should have the highest priority on that are related to breast cancer prevention as well. Very nice. And Silent Spring, I was so um, excited to see that as an organization because that, of course, is the, the book that got us all um, alerted to the toxics in our environment. So, um, yes, so yes, that, it is. So that she's back again. <laughs> and Breast Cancer Fun, we're, we're going to have a, a speaker from Breast Cancer Fun on this on this tele summit. So all good organizations, really, really important newsletters, you know, to sign up for, and um, and books to read. And I love your idea of passing little changes to your book, passing it on to another um, family member or friend, and kind of keeping it going forward that way. It's very, um, it's a very soft way of of helping others, really. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That, as a newbie author, that was something I was really surprised at and did not expect when Little Changes launched. Initially, I wrote Little Changes to help my speaking. Speaking is what I love to do when I'm interacting with the audiences, speaking at health conferences or women's conferences. That's my place where I love to be. And there's only so far you can go as a speaker until you need a book, <laughs> something about our world. Mm -hmm. So I thought that's what little changes. I thought that's what her place was in the world was my sidekick. But as soon as she launched, she started to ripple forward and was this this random act of kindness book where people would be like on page 87 or 102 and they'd be emailing me saying, oh, I need to order one for my, my niece in Colorado or my cousin in Florida or my story sister just was diagnosed with cancer. And they'd be mm -hmm. coming back and ordering second as gifts, which absolutely just sends chills down my spine. Mm -hmm. Right. It's nice to know that that your work is out there, out there and live and, and uh, getting into our homes. I love it. I love the book myself. All right. Can you explain to us how advocacy works um, locally and at the state and national level? Because um, I think if, if we can understand that a little bit better, we can, we're more apt to be involved. And also the role of press conferences, because we see press conferences all the time happening on the news. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, we know little about them and how they come to be. So, Sure, sure. I, I'd love to share my interpretation of what advocacy is out there. And we did touch on what I think is the most powerful advocacy, which is the everyday me's educating forward. And in this world of social networking and just sharing an article forward from Facebook and being able to share like that is incredibly powerful. But more in the more traditional sense, when I came into this and it was new to me, I would observe um, these mom br brigades where we would go in. When I participated in was we marched on the city of Boston, so, you know, the mayor's um, steps in the city of Boston, wearing red capes, you know, saying, you know, going along the lines of being a superhero, and this is what we have to do in order to fight for the safety for our children. Um, so I kind of did these little testing things, like, is this me? Is this who I want to be? How do these things work, and why do we do this as, as women or organizations or nonprofits or those who are fighting for legislation? So I tested a couple of them out. One of them was in, the, in Boston there. Another one was going down to the FDA and, and protesting with the big posters and marching down um, at the FDA for labeling of GMOs. And then the third one was a very different one in itself where I was invited to be a speaker at this, the Senate houses in Washington, D.C. to talk about toxin reform. And I think what I witnessed being part of these was that it brings attention. It brings attention to the topic, and if we can get the attention of the press, whether it's you know, Huffington Post or the Atlantic or the Washington Post or the New York Times, whatever it is, then that is that connector back and over down to the mainstream. So for me, being participating in these events is hugely about creating waves that then create education. 
the second ripple of this is then as the everyday me's are being educated and start to find a voice, the second ripple is then our leg legislators and our elected officials start to notice what's going on. And that's the key part because, honestly, we can make as many little changes as possible. We can make one a day for 20 years, and we're not going to be able to fix it all. It also has to come down to supporting change at the uh, national level. And part of that is getting the attention of our elected leaders. And that's very nice to hear, you know, from somebody who's done that kind of work and really seen results come from it. <laughs> so that's, we, that's, that's a good, yeah. It is impactful. It, there, it's an area mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I never thought I had interest in or that I was going to be part of. But sometimes life throws you little journeys <laughs> and you just have to run with them. And that's when you really learn a lot. And when I was in D.C. last, one of the things that I witnessed was senator after senator looking and listening to us and giving us the feedback that if change is going to happen, it's going to happen from the everyday me level, from the grassroots level. And that just was electrifying to hear. That's how important it is. And, and they are listening. Because, you know, it's as a political activist, it's really frustrating when, when we have these big marches and we turn out in the thousands and the millions, and it's never covered in the news. And when it is covered <laughs> in the news, the numbers are less than half, you know. Uh -huh. And we were there. We know what the numbers were. Uh -huh. And so, um, but they do know about it, even if it's not in the press and and it's not out there for the for the masses and everybody to for the citizenry, you know, to know about. Mm -hmm. um, it's on social media, and we are getting the attention of the elected officials. And mm -hmm. it's just important to be there. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you know what I think too? The issues that we're talking about really cross political lines. I mm -hmm. think whether you're a Republican or whether you're a Democrat or whether you're a Green, you know, mother. You want to do the best thing for your child, and if if stopping those dryer sheets with the fragrances that you know your kid's going to be smelling 24/7, mm -hmm. you know, and messing with their <laughs> neurotransmitters, you know, if that's it, it doesn't matter what your political pers persuasion is, you know, that really these are common issues to all of us it, as it moms is. and dads and mothers and sisters and aunties and you know. I, I agree. I, the world. <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly agree. I was being interviewed by the Atlantic when I was down in D.C., and then, and, I, and they were questioning me, you know, what do I think this is about? Do I think it's about being a Democrat or a Republican? And I, I just could not fathom fitting this topic of health into one or the other because it's not mm -hmm. about politics. It's about our children and it's about health and who who's anti health. <laughs> we might be able to answer that, but <laughs> um, it was very very hard, and I, I could really feel this this push of trying to cram it into one side, a he versus the she, or a, to polarize the topic. And I find that terribly unfair to polarize this topic. And it's in your own family. You know, and I think that's happening now because there is so much cancer. Every legislator, every um, CEO, you know, everybody is is there's there's so much awareness of cancer, mm -hmm. and now we're now we're educating to prevent. And I think that's the next really big step for for cancer is um, is the prevention aspect of it. Absolutely. I, I love, love this series that you're hosting, that it's free, that it's accessible, that women can share this forward, that they can pass it forward. And I hope that so many of the women who are listening to us today, that they're able to connect with me, to come over to Choose Wiser, to just enter the name into the email so that I can start communicating with them. And to me, it's this vision of we're, we're linking arms, that we're coming together 
and we're linking arms together and we're forming this this massive army that's coming together over this last couple of years and it's incredibly powerful and I invite every woman who is out there listening or every person to to do that to connect with me and choose wiser and that way now we're even tighter and closer together all of us that's right and and we're we're more powerful in numbers for sure all right thank you very much Christy Marsh for sharing your story and your experiences and your advocacy tools with us and, and your explanations of, of how advocacy works. That really gave some clarity. Um, and we've all learned a lot, um, and, I, and I think we're inspired towards taking action, whether it's um, changing our shopping list a little bit or whether, um, whether we get involved locally or nationally or globally in some of these um, organizations and, and um, Changing, changing the voting that, that we do, I think, and changing some of these elected officials that, that are voting for us and speaking for us. So um, is there anything else that you want to leave us with? No, I agree with exactly what you're saying. I think every single listener out there that your place does not have to be what I do, and it doesn't have to be um, what you do, Ginny, but everyone has a place and that they can contribute in their own way. And it's tremendously important. And whether it's a little change focusing on the home or a community or whatever scale, all of those are very, very important for all of this. And I want people to feel proud about that and celebrate it. And that I hope, I hope that over the next year that I'm able to come across some of these listeners out on when I'm out on the road and when I'm touring at different conferences. Mm-hmm. Um, to meet people face to face, it would be a delight. Very nice, very nice. Thank you, thank you again, Christy, for all that you do. And please connect with Christy at her website. It's choosewiser.com, and it's a really friendly and safe place to link arms with other women and other folks advocate, advocating for healthy changes. And Christy says she believes that linking arms, she believes in that, and comparing notes. We advance more quickly that way, and we're no longer out there woo-woo or crazy for pursuing what we believe to be right. There's something incredibly powerful about locking arms and coming together. I love that quote by you. And don't forget about her book, Little Changes, and um, Tales of a Reluctant Home Economics. That's M-O-M-I-C-S, Pioneer, and that's also at ChooseWiser.com. And please subscribe to Christie's Be Choosy newsletter. I love the newsletters that are coming from these different organizations that you spoke of in your own newsletter because it gives us information that we don't get in, in really any other place. Mm-hmm. And there's also a, a topics a presentation topics on her website that she um, speaks about, and she, again, speaks around the country on, on these different topics. So thank you again to Christy Marsh for contributing her experiences and expertise to our Preventing Cancer Telesummit and podcast series. And thank you to all of you for taking time out of your busy day to join us. And I hope that we've informed and inspired you in many ways that improve your health and your longevity and your desire toward advocacy. And if you're looking for new ideas and the latest information on preventing cancer, please try to catch more of our podcasts in this series and also on green lifestyles and sustainable and sustained living. And please share these interviews with your friends and family. You never know who you may be helping. And I hope that you will take the time to make the healthy changes you heard about today a priority in your life. Keep listening and bye for now.